strong when you feel weak in your brokenness complete shout to the north and the south sing to the east and the west Jesus is Savior to Transformers, as we behold you through your word. You said that if we love you, we will keep your commandments. And how can we know your commandments unless we know your word? So, Father, cause us to love your word and live by your word, breathe by your word, eat of your word, partake of your word, that we may become transformed like you. In Jesus' name, and everyone say, Amen. Amen. Praise God, we are synchronized. And we're going to do, oops, let me 
change the angle. We are on chapter 6 of the Gospel of Luke today. And remember that there are lots of miracles that our Lord Jesus did. And there could be many miracles that uh, are chosen or written about, like John says. Uh, if everything is written about what Jesus has done, there is no place and no books that can contain all that he has done. <coughs> so when we look at this, we must also consider the fact that uh, Luke particularly chose some of these incidences. And we need to not only look at the incidences, but look at why Luke chose them. So, as we move into chapter 6, we know from chapter 5 that while Jesus' ministry began, he was as much interested in his disciples as much as he was in doing his ministry. Now, if you ever enter into the ministry, which all of you will enter to a certain extent, do you know that in the Bible everyone has a ministry? If you need a verse for that, it's Ephesians chapter 4. The fivefold ministry is to prepare every believer for a ministry. Now, ministry does not mean necessarily that you, you might be full-time in it. But it does mean that you have something that you contribute to the body of Christ. Let me just cross-reference over. what? In Ephesians chapter 4, since it's tied to the topic that we're talking about. <coughs> Verse 11, we know. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. But look at what the fivefold is supposed to do. Say apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers are not just supposed to perform and do their ministry. But in our modern world where fivefold ministries struggle, where many in full-time ministry struggle, and uh, then others are just happy where they are, they're professional clergymen. They forgot the purpose behind all ministry. The purpose why apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, why they exist. And most of the time, the fivefold ministries give the impression, especially uh, not everyone, but a great number of them, that they are there for the body of Christ to serve them. And there is a grand thing to become one of the fivefold or any position in the Lord. But our Lord Jesus himself tells us, the Son of Man came to serve and not to be served. He came, he came to do something. He came to reveal something. And we must always focus on that. Like I'm always aware What's the purpose of why I exist? Why uh, am I in the ministry? Why am I doing what I am doing? And it's to be the personification, I know, of wisdom, to be uh, the personification of, uh, now I know, to be the right hand of God, to demonstrate what it means, to be the personification of the revelation of Christ, so that if I'm supposed to be personification of wisdom, that means that anything you ask about God should be able to answer. So that's my goal. And uh, to help people to understand God. It to be the personification of the right hand of God. I understand that uh, it should be personification of His power. If you examine the right hand of God, it always demonstrate about His power. And left hand always represents His love. And uh, so His power on one hand, is balanced by His love. So there must be a personification of power, personification of love. It is important for us to understand what each one of our call and role is. Some things in life you do not choose. They are chosen for you. And of course, if you go back to before this planet Earth and your birth, you would say that well, we did have some choices, but our choices were guided to a certain extent because none of us will have the full understanding of the way, the road to choose. Plus, even way back before God breathed out all spirit beings and created us, He really has in mind what He had, what He wants. 
that every one of us like is represent a single cell of who he is and combined together we paint a picture of who god is just like every single part of our body are made of cells and organs and tissues and in the same way every creation of god including human the human race angels spirit beings and every other thing when we cluster together we are like one of the organs and tissues of the body but individually we are all cells that represent a part of God's attributes in the end we all display God's attributes and it is important for us to understand that all fivefold ministries exist to help the body of Christ discover who they are there you find it for the equipping or perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry you didn't realize you have a ministry everyone who is born again has a ministry there is something which God has for you to do there are some things that are what I call you know in the world they got human rights what we have what we call your born again rights your born again rights and these are your born again rights number one the day you were born again you were chosen for some special ministry it need not be full-time some might grow into full-time but it's something when we talk about full-time in terms of food clothing shelter <coughs> to a certain extent if everyone is a good steward by a certain age you will probably have taken care of your food clothing and shelter and they put it on like an auto mode <coughs> kind of thing, your investments in there, they take care of basic needs, in that sense. So in the end, everyone moves to serve the Lord with all their time. But in terms of special calling to full time, some people do not have the opportunity to accumulate wealth because they call from young into the ministry. And they're supposed to live off uh, with the ministry. Like the Bible says, do not muzzle the ox. <coughs> Let the ox trade the grain, eat of whatever the ox needs. <coughs> There are very few ox that will eat all the grain. <laughs> and then there's no grain yet. They say, hey, why the ox treading the grain? There's no more grain. The ox ate it all. Look at the ox, it's so fat. No. You know, there should be enough, more than enough grain. Uh, let the ox that tread the grain eat of the grain. Eat of what is needed. So, outside of talking about full time, everyone has a ministry. That's your first basic knowledge you need to know. So, let's make the confession. Say, I have a ministry because I'm born again. I will discover the ministry the Lord has for me. Amen. Number two, every born again believer has a gifting of the Spirit. You didn't know that there are a lot of things that you had. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone. Correct? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So everyone has at least a minimum of one gift, if not two or three. Gifts of the Spirit. You need to discover what your special gift is. Even if the end you desire to operate all the 12 gifts, you need to start with one or two. Nobody starts with all 12. You have to be faithful to where you operate. <coughs> then God sees you're faithful, He might teach you the others. So it's important. The second confession. Say, I'm a believer in Christ. I, believer in Christ. I have giftings of the Spirit, have of the Spirit. given to me. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So discover your gifting. And these are not just talent. Talents is from your soul. That God gifted you when you were born. Giftings are come from the anointing of the Holy Spirit on you. It has to do with your being born again. So you all have a ministry. You all have a gifting of the Spirit. Now who's going to train you in that? All the five folk. So that is why it is 
uh, horrible if a fivefold things that exist on their cell. You know, apostles or even prophets who think, you know, I, I am a prophet. Hey, wait a minute, you are a prophet, you're supposed to help me find a ministry, not to establish yourself. There you go. So, you have a ministry, you all have a gift of the Spirit, and <laughs> let's give you some more. Number three, everyone is given a measure of faith to help you enter the ministry. You do not enter the ministry by your own strength. <coughs> Romans chapter 12. Paul says not to boast, but he says, if anyone will consider not to think of yourself highly than another, you know, think of who you are, think about the grace that God has given to you. <coughs> the faith, the position that God has given to you, it's the gift of God, <coughs> not because of your achievement. Like being a voice actor at midnight, it's a gift of God. I have to qualify myself for the gift. I have to still be trained, but it's a gift waiting to be received. The same way there are gifts and faith and positions waiting to receive. There's a level of faith. And that faith produced a ministry. For that one, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 one is very basic, so I'm not turning to that. But Romans 12, uh, Romans 11, did I say Romans 12? Romans 11. <coughs> Romans 12, actually. It says here, For I say to the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly or seriously, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Do you know what verse 3 is saying? Do you understand what verse 3 is saying? Verse 3 is saying, not to be proud, correct? Not to think highly. But then he's saying something else. When he asks you not to think too highly, he also asks you to think. He never says, think lowly. He never says that. He says, to think according to the measure of faith God has given to you. Do you know that when God gives you something, you must have faith in what God gives you? Because faith is still a choice. Which means that if God called me to the voice at cry at midnight, I must not be shy about the job. I must say, I stand in a place and I proclaim that place. Just as Paul was called to be an apostle, correct? In every epistle, he doesn't apologize for that. He said, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you apologize? No. He is allowed to think of himself according to his calling, making no apologies. Sometimes he even say, you know, he's the least of the apostles. Sometimes he say the opposite, you know, I'm, you know, yet I would be on par with all of them, he says. Because when it comes to the measure of faith that God gave him and the measure of grace, there is a measure of faith, measure of grace, that God gave him to be an apostle, he must accept and think like an apostle. He cannot think any lesser than an apostle. That's what verse 3 is saying. He must think of himself. He, uh, he must not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think. To think what? Soberly, seriously. Now, we haven't translated that, so we need to look at the Greek. The Greek is sophronio which means to think correctly, to think of a correct mental picture. And that means if God calls you to be a prophet and you don't want to think of yourself as a prophet, you're shaming God. If God calls you to be an apostle, you're afraid to think of yourself as an apostle, you're shaming God. You're not thinking rightly. So it's not so much a pride. Then what is it, you say? To accept your gift and position it's a personal thing you must have first before it can function. When you go out in the street, sometimes you know you have policemen doing a good job, doing everything. What happens if the policeman is not uh, thinking of himself as a policeman or not thinking of himself with authority? Can he function? He'll be like, scary, scary policeman. 
Who wants a scary, scary policeman? You want a strong policeman who knows his job, who knows where he is, and he's allowed to use a weapon if necessary. He's allowed to arrest you if necessary. He's, he has his rights to stop you, to dominate you, to do whatever he wants within his authority, of course, without abusing his power, correct? A policeman who does not know his authority cannot carry on his job. A soldier who does not know his authority cannot carry on his job. A lawyer, a judge, an architect who does not know who they are cannot carry on the job. If an architect is an architect, he is there to say this is right, this is wrong. That structure will not work. He has to say with authority. He cannot say it like a mouse. In all the living creatures, have you seen one living creature called the mouse? Because the mouse represents something else. When it comes to number three, who you are, you must think soundly and correctly. Without pride, with full humility, but if you're challenged, remember Paul's apostleship was challenged? And he wrote to the Corinthians, he says, do I not have a right over you as apostles? And he almost like questioning it. How dare you question my authority as an apostle? And he wrote to them, you know, wait till I come, I'll discipline each one of you. He was serious when it comes to his apostleship. So, number three, all of you have a measure of grace and faith in the body of Christ. You might say, you know, ah, I might not, I'm not right, right hand, but you discover you're the right thumb. <laughs> so you say, I'm the right thumb. Hey, right thumb very important. Or the left thumb. Or the little finger, which is artistic looking, to balance all the other finger. So, you need to have authority and the faith to accept who you are in the Lord. In order to function. If you don't accept that, you cannot function properly, I can tell you. The anointing will only work when you accept it with authority. So, did I say number three yet? Okay, so number three. Say, I'm a believer, I'm a believer. in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I have, I have the, measure of faith, the measure of faith, the measure of grace, measure of grace. to become one of the positions in the body of Christ. Amen. So there you go, you got ministry, and uh, <clears throat> you have a gifting of the Spirit, and the gifting establish you, you have a position in the body of Christ. That is why Ephesians 1 is a prayer for everyone to know what is the hope of His calling, what is the riches of His inheritance in the saints, was the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that background we need in our thinking, and then we come to the book of Luke, and here's the thing. Far too many ministries cannot be like Jesus Christ because they are spending too much time trying to become who they are instead of just letting it be. Did Jesus try to be Jesus? <laughs> Did Jesus try to be an apostle? No. Did Jesus try to be a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, or teacher? No. He just knew who he was. So he did not spend his time trying to become an apostle, trying to become a prophet, trying to become an evangelist, trying to become a shepherd, a pastor, or a teacher. He never. He just be and do. You just do whatever God wants. He accepts that He is. Jesus is the Son of God. When the devil says, If you're the Son of God, no question of if, remove the if. If you're a Son of God, if you're an apostle, if you're a prophet, all those things are gone. But most of the time, too many ministries are spending so much time trying to become who they are. They forgot their job is to train others to become. Correct? According to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, every fivefold ministry 
is to prepare or perfect the body into the ministry. So our job is to help you discover your ministry. And then to perfect you, to train you. To perfect you is to train you. To become who God asks you to be. That means if you have a gift for prophecy, to train you to function in the gift. If you have a gift of tongues, to train you to function in the gift. If you have a ministry or a calling God in a particular area to establish and help you into that ministry. That's what every fivefold is supposed to do. We, I've been trying to do that in every fivefold church I planted. But look at every church that exists today, both mega and mini and medium size. They are so engrossed in church programs, perhaps evangelizing the world, planting more churches. They are so involved in uh, continuing the fivefold ministry that they have that they forgot that the purpose is to train everyone for a ministry, for the gifting that God has. So what happens to a person when you attend a mega church for 20 years and the only thing you achieve is sitting on the pew and your knowledge has increased? And that's it. Now tell me, did that fulfill Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12? Then God should tear down every church and rebuild it, which He is doing. In the coming waves of shaking. Until every church realize that they are there to train. There to train each person, so that each person does not become just a pew-sitter. Each person finds their place in God. But a lot of pastors are afraid of that because if every member can prophesy, if every member can see vision, if every member can function and do the miracle, miraculous things, they might be afraid they don't have a job. But their job is to treat everybody and keep them functioning. That's their job. Actually, if we got a modern word for it, which Paul in those days don't have. A coach. A coach. Who functions as coaches? There's a tennis coach there, because he knows again he played tennis before. And were you very good in tennis last time? Yes, sir. I social tennis. Okay, social. But he can train beginners. So that after he finished training, let's say under Mohan, and they need another level of training, then they must get better and better players to train them. So a lot of those who are, who are in the championships or tennis competition, their coach are other players. A five-fold ministry is like a coach. Who is the coach training? Put out the mirror. <laughs> That's it. So we need to understand the structure of the church. It's to train every believer for who God called them to be. That's what a coach is for. And the coach is sometimes there, like when you have a football team or 12, the coach will tell one player, say, hey, you're good at scoring. So you function in the second part. And, and they say, okay, you're good at catching balls, let be the goalkeeper. Hey, you're good at defending. You, you be defending on that side. That's what the coach is supposed to do. And the coach might come up with some strategy for the whole team. And the coach might study the opponent team and say, okay, against this team, we must adopt this different strategy. So the coach knows where to put everybody so that everybody can function and play the game. But the coach himself doesn't play the game. But the coach knows how to play the game. The coach prepares everyone to play the game. Just as the purpose of Fivefold Ministry is to prepare every single Christian believer for their own ministry. For their own ministry. And from time to time, if you analyze church history, God has blessed different denominations or para-ministries that tap a little bit on that. For example, 
uh, when you with a mission first started, they tap on something that nobody tapped on before. Because until that time, missionaries have to be full time. And like you have a divine calling and your whole life is to be a missionary. They tap on something, what we call a short term missionary. Where a person who might be skillful in certain things, he might use his skill in another country, in another outreach. Even a plumber can go and help plumbing in another place while preaching the gospel. A carpenter can go and build another house in a poor place. So they tap on something. They give a mission to every person. When instead of being a missionary calling the rest of their life, people go onto the mission field for six months, one year, two years. So of course they came up with their own strategy for financing people, which every system can be abused. So like they have people support them for two years, then they go kind of thing, which is an interesting system. But as a result of that, many people don't know how to learn to live by faith. That means, uh, when Jesus sent them, sent the disciples out, He didn't say, okay, find 10 sponsors, then you go. Never. He just, in fact, He sent them, He said, don't take any money. I want you to learn to live of charity. Well, in Jesus' training, even tougher. And so, why are we touching this topic? Because we're talking about Jesus. Jesus did not leave behind a house, properties, books, tapes. Jesus didn't leave behind anything when he finished. Where was Jesus' investment? In the lives of his disciples. Look at that. That was Jesus. Jesus literally invested his life in his disciples. And at the end of his ministry, that was all there was. He didn't leave behind properties, money, finances, books, or anything. He invested in other lives. Can we be like Jesus? We must invest in lives. He had faith in lives. Now with that background, you can understand why in chapter 5, Jesus was focused on finding the people to invest his life. Now, he did not just invest his life in the 12. Because later on in chapter 10 of Luke, you got the 70. But he literally invested his life in his disciples. And remember when you read the book like his disciples, and now we look at the cross reference also, Logos King James, his disciples, it is always more than the twelve. The twelve were like leaders over other disciples. I hope you don't get the picture that he only chose the twelve. No, you know why he has to choose the twelve? Because afterward you see the Greek translation. He had a multitude of disciples. So let's look at that. Okay, let's see how much time we got. Good. It came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first. Now why is Luke choosing this story? Because Luke was trying to show the confrontation Jesus had with the Jews. It's always over the Sabbath day. And they were so religious about the Sabbath that Jesus purpose, uh, that Jesus saw almost purposefully heal on the Sabbath. <laughs> he did heal on other, other days. But when the Sabbath came, he especially also go Sabbath and heal. And that annoyed the Jews even more. Remember in cross references, they tell him, there are six days to heal, why you must do it on the Sabbath? And Jesus spoke a parable that showed the hypocrisy when he tells them, if you, if on the Sabbath you're, 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 you're traveling a donkey, donkey actually stumbled, will you put the donkey out? Will you leave the donkey there to die or whatever? No, most of it quickly pull them out. So he showed the hypocrisy. But this first part of the story is to show 
Jesus' understanding of the Sabbath. Why he did what he did. Came to pass on the Sabbath day. Now, in some translation, they put corn. And I read long ago, corn was only discovered more or less when America was discovered. And then they brought it over. So they might have their own different type of grain of corn, but the correct translation for the word corn is the word grain. Not even wheat. Because in the Greek it never say, unless sometimes it mentioned, but most of the time it never say whether it's wheat or barley, which are the two type of crops planted most often, wheat and barley. So we cannot assume they have a general word for grain. Grain. And which can be wheat or barley. Definitely, if they put corn, it is an old English word that might have meant grain. But not relevant today. So if your Bible still is saying that, change your Bible. Poor translation. It says, He went through the grain fields and his disciples plucked the ears of grain and ate them rubbing them in their hands. And you know why you need a good translation? I remember when I read this part of the Bible as a young believer. I was only probably about 17 or so when I came to know the Lord. And, and uh, then they gave me the old King James. I remember it was like corn. And then in my imagination, I know corn can be eaten raw. I, you know, and, and you can be jagong, you know, made the maize. And you can rub. So, you keep thinking on that, but no, it's not. It's more closer to either barley grain or wheat grain. And uh, I don't know whether when some of you remember when we were on our uh, trip to Australia in altar building and we went to a certain place. Uh, and then I show you all wild wheat and wild grass. And actually all grass and wheat came from cultivation of grass. And I show how they are little grains, and you can peel them and eat them. And sometimes when I go on a hike or go on a bushwalk with my dog, uh, I would just, for the fun of it, you know, take it and just, just take the small little thing that's edible. It's the, it's the little grain of grass, the heads of grass that look like uh, uh, paddy or wheat. And also we have wild wheat that is there. And it's actually quite edible. Especially when you pluck it, it's not hard. It's hard only when it's fully ripe. Before it's fully ripe, it's quite soft. And has a nice taste. So if any one of you have never eaten that, this is what it tastes like. So the disciples were hungry. And as they go through, it happened to be a, a field of grain, whether it's barley or wheat. And most of these, before they are ripe inside, is very soft. They're protected by hard thing. And so they was like peeling them, and I learned like peeling watermelon seeds. The Chinese is a peel of watermelon seeds. And it, so they were like peeling them and eating them. And it's quite nice uh, to eat. It's actually quite tasty. And uh, you could eat it raw because it's soft, it's not hard. And so they were rubbing them because they will have to peel the thing. Rubbing them and peeling, rubbing them, peeling it. And then the Pharisees who must be following them, <laughs> what, were the, what, what were the Pharisees doing in the grain field? It was not like in a synagogue. And this is like outside walking in a grain field. And who are these Pharisees who hang around with them? Let me tell you who they are. They're actually followers of Jesus. Would you, who else go to with Jesus into the green field? You know, let's say one fine day we, we, we do altar building and we go through a paddy field and all that. Who else will be there except people who follow? Would, would our enemies or people who don't believe be following me into the paddy field? <laughs> of course not! So actually, these Pharisees are followers of Jesus. So not all the followers of Jesus are following 100%. Some of them got a mind on their own. They're just there to look, see, look, see, look, see, look, see. Wow, Jesus go to grave with yeah, look, see, look, see. Then a few things they disagree with, they started grumbling. So these Pharisees are Pharisees who follow Jesus. 
And uh, then when they see other thing, they, 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 they brought their own church idea, their own idea of what a church should be like. So they oh, I come from this church, we used to do that. I came from that church, we used to do that. Oh, yeah. So now you, because you came from that church, that church, you know what end time church is like. Ah. They have no idea what end time church is like. Because remember, the pattern of the church is revealed top down, not bottom up. Unfortunately, that's the way it is. Where did they, who got a plan to build the tabernacle? Moses. Where did Moses get it from? He got it from God in a vision. He didn't come up with his own idea how to have a new set of worship. These things you don't play play. You know in Singapore, one of your comedy, you have this fuzzy hair guy, I think his name is Singh or something. Uh, he always say, don't play play. Uh. <laughs> this is something you don't play play. Uh. <laughs> play play. <laughs> you play play, you die. <laughs> Who got the plan to build the temple? David. Came from top down. Who has a plan for the pattern of the church? The apostles and prophets. So, they come and they say, we don't do things this way. Of course they don't do things that way. This, if, we keep, if the church continues as it is in its old ways, it will never change, never be renewed. In 2,000 years of church history, what have we learned? We learn what the whole world also learned. The one common thing is change. <laughs> Church must change. People change. Church must also change. But we don't change into the world. We change and adapt as God reveals more things. New revelation change. Like our worship style changed when we became Pentecostals. Before, before you spoke in tongues, you, your, your worship style is different. Then when you speak in tongues, you learn worship styles like, like raising hands. I remember as a Baptist, First time, charismatic, you go charismatic, people were lifting their hands. It feels so strange to have my hands up. The hands just want to be down. Now, after so many years, it feels so strange with the hands down. Your hands just want to go up and praise the Lord. Now, that is a Bible pattern. Because there are like seven Hebrew words for worshipping God. One of the, those is to extend the hand upwards. And what did Paul say about worshipping God? I pray, I will that men everywhere lift up their hands and pray. Correct? It's the Bible! Except that from our own tradition, we, we don't have that, so we say, okay, we don't do that. But lifting our hands is in the Jewish culture, Jewish uh, tradition, and in the New Testament. First Timothy. <coughs> There is God's will for men to pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. And also, he, in the book of Hebrews, it says, lift up your hands and hang down. So, we are the one who should get used to it, instead of making God get used to us. So we have that. These are actually, some of the followers of Jesus who still have their mind to be renewed. He said, why are you doing this? It's not lawful for us to do it. You cannot even rub your hands and eat the food. And Jesus said, oh Jesus, he really hit them. Have you not read this, what David did when he was hungry, when they were with him? Well, he, he knew the right scripture. And uh, continues, he says, can we continue this too? And uh, <clears throat> verse 4, 5, thank you. How he went into the house of God and took and ate the showbread and gave also to those who were with him, which it is not lawful to eat but for the priests alone. And then he said this statement, very important. The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. And it, when you cross-reference, he actually say, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Wow, that finished them all. 
That means he's going to change everything. He's going to change everything. This Jesus came from nowhere. Changed everything. He reinterpreted what the Sabbath meant. And then, verse 6, another Sabbath. <laughs> this little are focusing on the Sabbath controversy. These are the little things that make the Pharisees upset. And God knows how to find the things that upset them and told Jesus to do it. So here's another incident. On the Sabbath, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him. They were looking, looking at him intently. They watched him. And whether he will heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. They were looking to accuse him. They were not following him necessarily. Now, of course, this one is in the synagogue. Some are not his followers. But I think some of Jesus' original followers, who were Pharisees, with the exception of Nicodemus, of course, were not really followers. They were there to spy on him. They were there to spy on him and report him to the Pharisees. You know, in the grain field. So it made him more angry because he was not keeping the Sabbath according to the rule. So finally, on that day, there was a man with a withered hand. And Jesus said, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he stand there. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? Well, this one he challenged them. He challenged the Sabbath. He was there to tear down their wrong Sabbath system. And he really tore it down. He did it in the synagogue, which made them even more angry. Now, in a cross-reference, you will find in the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus actually looked around angrily at them on the same occasion of the man with the withered hand and uh, so okay let's look at that okay when you type withered hand and you know it's in the Gospels oops there is this one. Let's look at one of them. <clears throat> and let, I'd like to take the account from Mark. It's recorded in Matthew. In Mark chapter 3, verse 4 and 5, he said, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? Now, Jesus, here he mentioned, Jesus says, uh, Step forward. That means that is one of the sentences he said. See, the Bible doesn't record everything he said. Step forward and arise. Stand up. Is it lawful in the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? They kept quiet. And look at what Jesus did in verse 5. When he looked around at them with anger. But I... And it says it's the word okay. A violent passion, indignation. In other words, it's not a type of anger as we know as anger. It's a type of like um, frustration and indignation against their cruelty. It's the type of thing you feel when you see very cruel people doing bad things. The feeling that is there. And Jesus looked around at them and he was filled with this thing but his anger was not like a bad temper anger his anger was grief a sadness a sadness that these are the really most stupid people on earth who could create a law of Sabbath to prevent good people from being healed that is what Jesus felt so I want you to feel what Jesus feels through cross-reference. 
what he was feeling at that time. He was so sad at this dumb stupidity of their Sabbath understanding. So that they don't even let a person be healed. That was the feeling of Jesus. And especially at their hardness of heart. So let's go back to the Gospel of Luke. And it says, when he, and looking around on them all, so Luke also record, he looked around. So there was this silence for a moment. Everyone was looking. They were looking at Jesus. The man standing up was like the demonstration. He was also looking. Well, he's now become the personification of what was to happen. And then Jesus was also looking. Everyone looking, looking. So for a few seconds, a few minutes, it was a looking sermon. Nothing said. Everybody looking. Wondering what's going to happen. Until Jesus finally said, Stretch forth your hand. And the man stretched forth. Phew, it was healed. I like the instant part. It was instantly healed. Phew. And oh, the whole place, the whole pl atmosphere changed. It says, they, the Pharisees, in the old King James, it say, filled with madness. They went mad. Ah! You know, what, 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 what does a mad person look like? They went mad. And uh, in the New King James, it says, they were filled with rage. Also wrong picture. So, what picture shall we paint in the synagogue? Hey, this is not in the synagogue. You thought in the church, uh, they cannot go so bad. But here is a church, and the official church was a synagogue. You know, there were people in the old King James, they went mad. So the picture, ah, mad people. Or was it New King James? So which one is true? According to the Greek, <laughs> it was a word, a negation of the word mind. Like the word mind is the word no, noya. So to make it negative, the Greek adds an A in front of it. So it becomes anoya, which means like minus mind, no mind. And then I say, how to translate this? To translate this as angry rage or madness, like the old King James. So in the end, I look and look for the dictionary. I said, okay, there is a word. There is a word for a negative mind. Mindlessness. That means they lost their thinking ability. Cannot think anymore. They were, they were mindless. So it's either... They go mad or go neither. It was more like they were stunned and like you know for a moment they cannot think. For a moment the mind doesn't function. It was more and they were filled with that. And then they said they began to communicate with one another. What are we going to do about him? That is the picture. It was like a stun. Like a stun gun stunned them for some time. Except they were conscious and they cannot think. A state of shock and mindlessness. Like the mind doesn't function. Have you seen people who are temporarily in a state of shock or something? Their mind doesn't function. They're like, uh, don't know what to say, don't know what to do for a moment. They lost their mind. That's a correct picture. Neither super angry, nor become lunatics. <laughs> Mad people. They were filled with this blank. It's like blank. And in their blankness, the only thing they agree is, let's kill this guy. 
<laughs> in a moment of blindness, the only thing they could think about was, like, we want to kill this guy. We don't understand anything, but we know one thing, we just want to kill you. <laughs> they just want to destroy Jesus. And of course, you know who is behind it? The devil. They communicate one another what they might do to Jesus. And we know the conclusion is they will kill and destroy Jesus. Jesus was not bothered, but that miracle was stunning. As stunning as the one previous chapter where they let down the man. And these are all confrontation with the Pharisees. You know, Jesus doesn't play nice to his enemies and to those who oppose him. He doesn't play nice. He really gives it to them. And it's not in the sense of doing the wrong thing. But he just couldn't care less what they think. Couldn't care less how they respond. Couldn't care less what his enemies do. Because he knew what he must do. And he knew God would take care of everything else. Is your life bothered by enemies? Bothered by unfriendly people? Bothered by people who upset you? You should not be. Because these people don't deserve your attention, don't deserve your time, don't deserve that you be affected. Don't waste your emotional energy, don't waste your thought energy on such people. God will take care of all these people. Love your enemies, that's all. But don't spend too much time or your thought energy or time thinking about them. Just let go. And Jesus went on and focused on what he wanted to do. It came to pass in those days that he went up out into a mountain to pray and continued all night. And the Greek word is the word you put over the 165 here. <coughs> it's the word dia. Uh, it should be the word daya nuk. And uh, nuk is the word night. Uh, daya nuk terio. <coughs> it's like through the night. Nuk is the word for night. Terio is like continue. So it's like continue through the night in prayer. And don't forget, Jesus all night is longer than our all night. He probably started from sunset and there was no pers nobody preaching long sermons or explaining things started from sunset praying right until sunrise so his all night prayer if it was like a 12 hour 12 hour thing lasted nearly 12 hours talk about the ability to pray long hours one of the tests that I always like to test once in a while is how long a leader can pray. And all night is a good test, and you watch how long they will last in the prayer. We should be able to pray 12 hours from time to time, effortlessly. And sometimes we have that. We have all night, once in a while, when the Lord leads, we might have all day prayer all day. That means we take a whole day off and pray. And so people come in the morning and they can go when they want. And it's like a day of prayer. We haven't got all day prayer in Singapore yet. But we have done all day prayer in Australia. But you'd be surprised. Even all day prayer, people can fall asleep. You know, all night people fall asleep, right? And obviously, we are, we are, we are robbing ourselves of sleep and you tend to get sleepy in the early hours of the morning. So in all night, you know, people will sleep. Uh, you might have micro sleep. But in all night, you purposely lie down, take your blanket, take your pillow. Now, don't worry. If you're new to the church, we allow you to do that. <laughs> We'd rather you pray a little bit and sleep at the side than don't pray at all. So, for those who are young, but for leaders, when you grow to be a leader in the church and you're still coming with your pillow, blanket and everything ready to sleep, you know. And uh, all night prayer, when the moment the lights go off, you, your blanket also go on. And you go... Then we say, this leader is not making effort. 
And I used to tell people many, many times that I look for leaders in the all-night prayer. I don't look for leaders in the commercial world. Uh, nor do I expect that just because a person successful out in the commercial world, they make a good leader in the church. No. I found some of them don't make good leaders. Sometimes a top CEO, you bring him to the church, you think he'll, he'll be a good leader. No. He doesn't understand that operating a company CEO with, let's say, 10,000 employees is different from uh, operating a church with 10,000 volunteers who are not paid by you, who have no obligation to you. These people need to be inspired by example, whereas there you can fire and hire people who don't listen to you. It's a totally different setup. So one who is skillful in that, the only skill they have is probably uh, their hard work, their energizing, and their strategy and goal setting. But, but if, you, if you, in the church, everything is about people. Plus in the church, there is the law of the weakest. Okay, how many times in the Bible did the Bible, did the Bible emphasize the weakest? The parable of the 99 sheep and the one sheep lost. One sheep was lost. The 99 were okay. Shepherd went for the one sheep. Romans 14, those who don't have enough faith to eat meat and they thought that eating vegetables alone is more holy. Paul says, go at the weakest. Correct. With them, don't stumble them. After all, you can eat meat and vegetables, so they can eat vegetables when they eat vegetables. So it was always flowing at the weakest chain. It's a totally different system from operating a big giant company of 10,000 or 100,000 workers. It takes a different ability. But many people just because they, they achieve something outside and they were a leader in some industry, they think that automatically when you can be a leader in a structure, a spiritual structure, doesn't. It's a different training. Totally. And Jesus, he prayed all night. The quality of leaders in the church and the glorious church is different from qualification to be CEO in any company. In a public company that might be, you know, a uh, $1 trillion company. There are only two companies today reaching almost a $1 trillion. Apple and Amazon. Yes, I do keep up with all the business trends. But I don't think these people make good leaders in the church. Because a company doesn't always care for the weakest. You only care, depending on what company is. Some companies only care for the profit margin. Some company directors only care for the share price. Because the share price go up, they get rewarded. The goals are different. It will be a foolish pastor or foolish apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor or teacher, senior pastor to think that a successful person outside can give you the best ideas in the church. And that's where it corrupts the church. We have seen that in 2000 years of church history. So everyone must go through the same thing. Don't care what their background is. That's what I call equality of believers. Equality in the priesthood. And whether a person is rich or poor, there should be no special chairs for the rich. He sits on the same chair as a person who is poor, who lives in a squatter area. There should be no special treatment for those who are high position or those who are no position. When they come to church, the church is a place that must inculcate that social mixture. Remembering this, see, I remember having been to heaven, one of the hardest things in heaven to do is to be able to get somebody from the higher heavens to sit side by side with those in the lowest heaven. The difficulty is not 
a difficulty of willingness or heart or compassion or love or humility. No. The difficulty is the energy that each contain. The higher energy is poisonous and destructive to those with lower energy. And so those on the higher one have to put on a lot of garments, tone down the energy to sit next to one who cannot tolerate too much energy. Even Christ has to reveal himself in a little light when he could reveal himself more. And that is a skill in itself. But the good thing about this earth is this. Our covering of flesh and bone creates an equality which is where somebody can be very close with God, somebody not so close with God. You can sit by side by side and still be very comfortable because of this clothing of flesh and bones. And it's the only time on earth, on planet earth, where God creates like dynamics. Once you leave this planet and you go to the spiritual world, even in a glorified body, for the highest level to come to the lowest level, there are a lot of things. Now, the lowest level can also visit the highest level, but they must put on a kind of protection, invisible protection, so that the intensity of light won't hurt them won't be painful. It's no more pleasure, it's actually hurting. It's just like if a person is used to the heat of the sun and a person not used to it, even going near already is dangerous. It's painful. Nobody dies, but it's painful. So understanding that difference in heaven and on earth, then I realize the earth is a place where we must emphasize the fellowship of equality so that people will maximize their enjoyment. Because once, once we go to heaven, you cannot just by yourself go into the highest dimension. It's painful for you. And it becomes impossible. That's why people tend to cluster of their own level together in heaven. And those like who are used to the level 7 glory will always be together and those level 1 glory and everyone progress but because everyone is progressive that differential of glory is still there. See, you assume that everyone progress equally but when you progress equally you never catch up. But some people progress faster of course. And so we should on earth now, enjoy the equality of fellowship. Because that freedom will be gone. And that's why God created the earth. To allow that. And to show that even when He allowed that, people will still choose different levels. Like for example, everyone knows that God loves everyone equally, correct? And that God is a fair God. Now God is fair because He never forces us to love Him. Love has to be from our free will. God loves every one of us. He loves you as much as He loves me. Not one atom difference. But the difference is how much we love Him. When you go to any place, in a small church, medium-sized church, or a large church, and you sit there with all the 10,000 people, think about it. Do all these 10,000 love God equally? You and I know the truth. No. Now, if you transfer the whole 10,000 or 100,000 or 1 billion people to heaven, do you think they can worship God at the same level again? I don't think so because of inequality of glory. And it looks like we're all attending at the same level. No, different already. Because when, when you, there's a certain times in heaven when you must take away all your covering and worship God as you are. Then you have freedom, correct? Imagine you're always covering before you worship. No, when you, you have to open yourself fully to God as God wants to open Himself. So when everyone is worshipping God at that level, you cannot even go near someone who is already worshipping God at full glory. 
the good news on earth you still can change that be among those who choose to love God above everybody else you will not withhold your love for God because God loves us all equally I encourage everyone to love God equally as equal as we can so that when we all go to heaven we can all sit in the same congregation <laughs> in the same glory because you can all we can all worship God at the same time but there will be different levels of glory we don't want that and I don't want to don't want that I would love to see and why Jesus came on earth he want as many as possible to enter into the fullness so change that in your life. I know it can be done. Love God with all your heart, mind and soul. And it's not limited to position. Remember? Even on earth, the people who are closest to God have no position. Mary, his mother, some of the Marys who serve him. They're close to Jesus, but they've got no position. So Jesus went up to the mountain to pray. When he came down, he did what he wanted. When he chose the twelve, it was not his twelve disciples because straight away he calls them apostles. Apostles. And uh, he chose them and he named them apostles. These are not the only disciples. We always say twelve disciples, twelve disciples. Sorry, you are wrong. They are twelve apostles. Jesus has a crowd of apostles, uh, disciples. Then the listing here is, is quite same. When you have a team of two, you got six teams. So team number one was always, you know, Andrew and his brother James and John. They are like also brothers together. And Philip and Bartholomew, and Bartholomew is actually Nathaniel. Remember Philip and Nathaniel are quite close. The only one is always team number five and six. The problem was always uh, five and six where uh, the last team here is Judas and Judas. <laughs> one good Judas, a bad Judas. And then the one before that was uh, James and Simon. When you cross-reference the twelve, and you cross-reference to Matthew chapter 10 when he sent them two by two, you find that only team number five and six switch. Because these Judas are always cannot get along with people. Right? So when, when you get along with another person, the two teams as a switch members. Otherwise, the other team, number one to four, always remain the same group that is there. And Jesus already start grouping them. What do we learn from the disciples? There are people whose destinies are tied to yours permanently. I've told many families, like for example, the two sisters, and Peter and uh, Andrew, James and John. Before you came down to earth, you were from the same section. We pray that when you go back to heaven, you remain in the same section. <laughs> Your physical relationships, it so happened that you choose to be born in the same family. But it need not be that you have to be born in the same family to be close. But there are definitely teams. And here's the thing. No one comes without team members. Batches are sent from heaven. Just like the 144,000 also get their team. They come in batches. We all come in batches to do a job here. Here is what I saw in vision, right? Let me leave that for a while. I talk about interesting things of vision. I saw before some of you all came to earth, you were given different training. One of the trainings, in fact, of most of you who came, was you were allowed to visit Moses in the spirit, and you saw the whole Exodus. Because you're part of the Exodus, especially those of you who are part of the Exodus, you saw the whole Exodus. And then after that, you were taken to see David, especially those in the Glorious Church. This was a lot of your training, and I'm speaking to some of those who are online. That we took you on an 
educational tour of Moses and all the years they went away. For us, it's like just passing like that, passing time. And then we also had an educational tour of David because of this end time. And then you were prepared after that with heavenly training, partly watching the earth training. Then you were ready to be born on earth, to be part of this end time, the glorious church and the exodus. So sometimes you might meet some people and you got a strange feeling of familiarity. I know you before. But physically, it might be the first time you actually met. Because some of those people were your teammates. You befriended them during some of these excursions that we have on earth or your training in heaven. There are always people that will be your team members and team players. And my advice, find them. Find them and become good friends on earth too. Paul and Barnabas were destined to be related in the spirit. Paul and Mark, yes. Paul and Epaphroditus, even today, when Paul appears from time to time, or visits churches, or visits us, he never is alone. One of the people always with him is Epaphroditus or Silas. Some of the friendships you have on earth continue into heaven. We pray that you'll find your teammates. Of course, your closest team player mate, should be your spouse. So it's something serious to pray about. And that's important. But then you have all the other people part of the team members that bring forth your strength. And as you know, Andrew has a different character from Peter. And they are paired to balance their soul nature. And the weaknesses and strengths in your life are paired together in order to help you fight your fights on the earth. Think about other pairings, okay. Elijah after some time find physical loneliness and he's single. And God actually answered his need when God chose Elisha. Elijah's personality is different from Elijah. Elijah was like a man of solitude who speaks very little and uh, who is not a very sociable person. He likes to be alone. Elisha, on the other hand, is someone who is more aware of people and slightly more sociable. And being a sociable person, you might be affected by people's comments. Just like he was affected when a group of young lads were teasing him. Bota he, bota he, right? That's Malay word. In the Bible, what they say is, ball headed man, ball headed man. And he got offended. Elisha was also affected by the sons of the prophets who came to advise him. So you can see he's a different personality. Elijah is not affected because Elijah don't care what you think. But Elisha cared a bit. When you care a bit, you got affected. So their characters are different, but it was for a purpose. It was for a purpose. They got joined you together with different characteristics. So, we have the twelve name, and after he named them, 
in verse 17, he came down and stood in the plain, and here is a verse where the word multitude happened twice. I have examined all the translation, and I found that there are two words for multitude. One is this word, oklos, which actually means crowd. The other is this word, which is plitos, which actually means full, fullness, like a mass of people, literally. Too many to count. Both have been translated in the Bible as multitudes, and it lends confusion. Which one is more powerful? Plitos. Plitos is so many you cannot count. Oklos is like a crowd. You can count them still can, but it's a lot of people. A lot to count. But Plitos is using the Greek word numerous. Like innumerable multitude. A mass of people. You couldn't count. And so, what was happening is he actually have a multitude of his disciples. Can you see the word multitude of disciples? Which is translated as a company or a crowd of disciples, Old King James company of disciples. Now sometimes you cannot uh, help, but you have to translate company in certain contexts. Like remember, we just finished chapter 5, it says there was a multitude of tax collectors. A crowd of tax collectors. And, uh, you can count them if you want, but there's so many to count. And so they use the word O-Clos. And in all the Gospels, uh, the word multitude, they don't differentiate. But I want to differentiate. I want to differentiate that Plitos means too many to count. Innumerable. innumerable. So I will use innu a great innumerable multitude of people. The other is just a multitude, which is the correct word. A crowd is a multitude. Jesus has a multitude of disciples. You all imagine that whenever Jesus traveled, there were the 12 and the 70. There were more than that. I will estimate that sometimes when he traveled, there could be hundreds following him. Hundreds. And sometimes they don't know, so he has his 12. Sometimes he has his other. Uh, sometimes he has between 12 to sometimes about uh, 100 people to sometimes several hundred and a few times you remember the crowd of people who were following him 4,000, 5,000 so sometimes they don't have a chance to, to, to be alone so there were these crowds that follow but among his disciples is a multitude Jesus probably got thousands of disciples but not all the thousands of disciples because they are not full time where is the trial are supposed to be full time? They have to leave everything. Now you can see something. Jesus appointed the twelve, not so that he only got twelve disciples. The twelve were called apostles. He appointed the, the twelve to be leaders over the multitude of his disciples. Because there were so many, he had to organize them. Remember who in the in a miracle of the 5,000 and 4,000? Remember what he has to do? The 12 have to organize them in group of 50s. That's how they can count. When you got a group of 50, and uh, then you have uh, 100 groups, that's where you got 5,000. And so, the 12 were supposed to be administrators and leaders over the multitude of disciples. That is what did not come out in the translation. So we always think of, he only got 12, he only got 12. No. He got thousands. I would say the 5,000 and 4,000 are actually close followers. Remember Jesus said, let's go aside to rest and then they all still follow. <laughs> And when he fed the 5,000 and 4,000, he was feeding his disciples. Remember how they said, Lord, you know, 
Even we, we, we use all the money, still cannot feed them. And so Jesus said, what do we have? And then he fed them with what? That was a miracle. Because Jesus said, you feed them. No, we don't have enough money. Remember what they said? Because these are all his disciples. May I change your mind that you think that Jesus has this cross of you. He actually has innumerable multitudes of people who are his hearers. Who want to be healed. But he actually got four or five thousand disciples. Except they all got jobs so they cannot follow him full time. Once in a while on a holiday, then they follow him. Then you go four or five thousand people. He appointed the twelve because he was getting too many disciples and they need some organizing. He appointed the twelve not because the twelve were the only disciples. Change your mind. See it from the Bible point. And he had a multitude of his disciples and a great innumerable multitude of people. Uncountable. Plethora. A full mass of people. Out of all Judea, Jerusalem, and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon. These are the other multitudes that we say are not really his followers. But to these... He would share with them inner things of his disciples. So the picture that we've been painted of Jesus and all the movies are all wrong. Because the movies only got very few, can right? Can count them on uh, your fingers and your toes. That's it, less, less than 20. Even in some of the best movies that they make today, like Jesus of Nazareth, AD, you know, uh, the AD stories and all that, the disciples all are very few ones. You know, it made others say, wow, only the twelve. Look, when they were praying together on the day of Pentecost, how many are there? How many are there? 120. 120! And then when Jesus appeared in his resurrection, you remember he don't simply appear to people but his disciples? You know how many people he appeared to? 1 Corinthians 15. I need to prove a point, correct? So proving a point. When Jesus rose from the dead, we know he don't simply appear to anyone. So when he appeared to people, these people must be important to him. These are classified as his um, uh, disciples. And uh, <clears throat> so Paul talked about uh, Jesus' appearances. Oh, the first fruits. Oh, sorry, I passed the thing. And. Uh, <clears throat> There, chapter, the first few parts. He says, of Jesus' direction, He was seen by Cephas, the twelve. And why didn't Paul mention the women? Okay. Maybe he's single, they include the women too much. <laughs> Remember, Paul is the one who said, Let the wives keep silent in the church. <laughs> okay. So, anyway, uh, don't forget the women, the one who saw him first. After that, he was seen by over 500 people at once, of whom the greater part remained. So he got 512. Then he was seen by James, his brother, by all the other apostles. Last of all, he was seen by me, Paul. Now, one thing you know, he did not include the women here. Because there is a Greek word for male and female. The word brethren here is Adelphos. Female brethren is Adelphe, sisters. So he included only the men. So he appeared to 513 men, uh, including Paul himself. If we include uh, his brother James, who became a leader, 514. So, if you include the women, I would say, you know, probably thousand whom he appeared to. Thousand, two thousand. Because Paul never counted the women. And there were probably more women than men who were closely following him. We know he appeared to um, Mary Magdalene. 
So this is proof that he actually has a multitude of disciples because Jesus specially only appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. And these are only those who told about his appearance. What about those who never tell? And were not recorded down. So you would say he has thousands of disciples. A lot of people happy already hearing, wow, they got the 70. They got thousands of actual disciples and followers. And here's the other thing. They did not include the Gentiles. Cornelius, I would say, is a f follower later on. Say, what about the Roman centurion? Cornelius came after. But what about the Roman centurion? What about the Syrophoenician woman? Who are, both of them have great faith, greater faith than all the Jews had. These are followers of Jesus. So the, the Gentiles also not, count, not counted. So there were a lot of uncounted people in 1 Corinthians 15. Now somebody has to remake the movies. <laughs> to show that most of the time, thousands are following him. That's how they got no time to eat. And uh, <clears throat> then the others, the innumerable multitude, the, the disciples follow him for his teaching. But the others follow him to hear him and to be healed. Different group. Can you see the two different group? His disciples are by the thousands. The innumerable innumerable, innumerable multitude. I got the one, I double check all the English terms. Innumerable means uncountable. Multitudes. Those are the ones who came for healing. And then verse 18. It's a little translation that I have uh, make it a bit different because of the Greek word. I really struggle with this one. And those who were mobbed by unclean spirits and they were healed. Say, what? <laughs> Because <laughs> in that word, <clears throat> in the old King James, it said those who were vex. And I checked the meaning of the word vex. Vex could be like emotionally distressed, strained. Didn't bring up the Greek translation. And uh, then the New King James translate as tormented. I say that's not a bad word. But then when I checked the English, they say tormented. I said, no, it doesn't bring across. And you know, to stay true to the translation, the word here is the word for crowds. And you put this word here, under here, 167. Okay. Okay, you see the word oclos or crowd. Then when you look at this word, it's the word ocleo. They take the verb, they take the noun and they make it into a verb. So the actual translation is, and those who were multituded by unclean spirits. <laughs> and when I when I translated it, I said, no, I got to stay true even though nobody is understanding things that way. But it brings an exposure to demons. Why? Demons would work in mobs. You, and you know, the word mob is a good word. Because when you're mob, remember mob justice. Mob justice is injustice. When people take the law into their own hands, like for example, you travel into a certain village and they tell you, if you have an accident, go straight to police station. <laughs> because if you remain there, you might be killed by the mob justice of the village. You still must report the accident, 
and uh, but mob justice is there, which is not true justice. They just uh, m uh, mob more lynch, they punish, they they want to make themselves the executioner, and uh, the judge, as well, you know. Uh, uh, as the one who carry out the job of arresting you. So, mob justice is not justice. I leave the word there and put the word mob because a mob is a crowd. It brings a translation. And you must understand, fallen angels might work singularly. Like, for example, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, because it exposed something about the demon world, which is why I like to leave it there. That fallen angels, they can work singularly by themselves. Like you remember the fallen angels sent to the Apostle Paul. That was actually the plastic trick. They can work singularly. Or the Prince of Persia that resisted Gabriel from coming to um, Daniel. But demons, unclean spirit, they work by a mob. Now, individually, and sometimes group, uh, when a person is possessed, remember Jesus talked about a person is possessed? The cast demon came out. How many did he count? Seven. Sometimes you have a group of them, seven. All the one who have a legion of demon. If truly a legion means a legion, then you're talking about uh, 6,000 demons kind of thing. That's like a mob. And you must understand the psychology of demons. That they always work in a mob. Which is why sometimes when you got all these thoughts, because they know if it's single, you can overcome. Single, you can overcome. But by exposing how demons work, you gain an advantage. So, they, 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 they attack you by machine guns method. They all come. <laughs> so, they got no time to think. So, at any time, you feel like you'll be mobbed. It's demonic activity. Cannot think clearly anymore. Whether it be a depression, anger, thoughts of anger, thoughts of depression, where you feel like constant or irritations, it be mock demonic presence. Immediately check, check your H. And increase your bubble, pushing them outside of hearing range. So once you know how they work, so I leave it there because that is how demons work. They travel in group, like vagabonds, like like thieves, like pirates in the sea. They organize themselves. You seldom see. A pirate in a sampan boat coming at you. Or let's modernize them. One pirate, whatever his name is, not Captain Spiral. One pirate, whatever his name is, not necessarily black beard, blue beard. And he comes, instead of one sampan, let's modernize him. In a speedboat, we are pirate, pirate, flag. And then the people say, Ah, pirate is coming! And only one pirate. No, it's always a group. Or thieves and all that. They work in a group because they need the group to successfully carry out their evil deeds. Singularly, they might lose one on one. So they try a whole group, a pack. And if, if we could apply, like, uh, what we say, a flock of sheep, a herd of cows, a pack of demons, <laughs> a mob of demons. That's how they work. 
Once they are exposed, you gain an advantage. So I leave that translation inside. And it's like mock by or upon actually is the Greek word mock upon. But that's how demonic de demons work. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. So for Jesus, he was releasing power all the time. We need to pray to the extent that literally your sweat is power coming out. Your breath is power coming out. We need to pray to the extent. Instead of seeing how you go to every environment and you're exposed to germs, you should see how you go to every environment and you're releasing the energy power of God. So the next time you're on a plane, especially plane is like a tin can. And if you see the videos on how germs spread in the tin can, front row 1A, of course, you know, my, oh, 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 oh. do you know Within one hour, it reaches the last one. Because <laughs> you're all sharing the air together. Don't care how big the plane is. It's just how long it takes before the whole plane gets it. And you thought your little mask can help. No. In the end, it's your immune system. Everything. Of course, if a person is spreading germs in front of you, you know, you're on uh, 12A, the person is on uh, 11A. <laughs> Once in a while, you not only get the germs and bacteria and viruses, but they also don't need a few drops of whatever it was. But you should think differently. Instead of all this affecting you, you should picture there is something coming out from you that is killing all these germs and virus. Now here's the thing. Jesus Christ was sinless, correct? And his body was no sin. He has to be perfect body to die on the cross. If one, one atom of sin disqualifies his body, one imperfection in his body, he cannot die on the cross for us. For he has to be a perfect lamb. Which imply that Jesus, when he was on earth, was exposed to all the virus and bacteria, sicknesses, fungi, everything in this world. And every germ and virus that happened to be in the air, and Jesus moved to the air, contact Jesus, they all go, eh! No matter how alive they were. Every one of them. In fact, they don't need to contact Jesus. Jesus has a bubble around him. So that, depending on how big the bubble is, sometimes it's bigger, sometimes smaller. Let's say it's about 20 centimeters from Jesus. So a virus or a germ goes near. And it's like some sort of force field. That is invisible to everybody except the microscopic level. Well, isn't it wonderful when you go back to heaven? Request to see the video files of Jesus. It's not actually called video files. It's actually a real historical archive in 3D. Then when you look at the files of Jesus' life and all the stories, you can see it in four dimensions because it shows the demons coming and going also, angels coming and going, but also have the ability to zoom into the microscopic level so that when Jesus was on earth there's bacteria in the air when they come a certain distance to Jesus they go Phew! they all die and then wherever Jesus was whenever he go near any plant and tree the plant and tree go <sighs> like they breathe another level of life everything that have life got some more life Everything that destroys life immediately dies. There's a bubble around Jesus. The good news, that bubble is also yours. Now, if you don't see it, it's not yours. Just like you could have tongues and you don't see that, don't know that you could speak in tongues. You have a spirit man and your spirit man speaks in tongues, it's tongues. 
The Bible says 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 and 15. But if you know there's such a bubble, now it can be yours. There is a bubble around Jesus. So the next time when you go onto the plane, be generous. Extend your bubble to everyone. Boom. A few times, I travel in a plane like bus. So there were a few times when sometimes the guy be behind me, and you know, you keep coughing. And you know, when because he's behind me, which direction does he cough all the time? So I would be the, you know, the generous recipient of all his breath. <laughs> but I sort of projected a bubble. And I said, Lord, at the end, I didn't actually pray for him. I didn't even talk to him. I said, Lord, at the end of it, may some level of healing come on him. And I could imagine each time he coughed, there's a bubble. It comes, die, die, die. The consciousness of that is there. And so I extend to him. And true enough, by the end of the trip, he was, you know, hissing and coughing less. So think about it on the opposite side. Instead of you catching, hey, is that mine? <sighs> this is not mine, right? This is yours. Huh? <laughs> it's not on my laptop. So can we just close that file? Put that, remind me later. I don't restart now. <laughs> don't pick a time, like, remind me later. And you do it at a different time. <laughs> okay. So, and, uh, <clears throat> so, remember that there is a bubble around Jesus. And that bubble was operating all the time. Except in his hometown, it didn't operate much because people don't have faith. But when people have faith, it operated. Let's look at verse 20 onwards. And uh, <clears throat> the few things we have learned about Jesus. And Jesus began what we call his second Beatitudes. Now this is like the Gospel of Matthew 5, but repeated. So he says, he little his eyes on his disciples. Remember, he's to his disciples. <coughs> There was a big crowd there. The Beatitudes was spoken to his disciples, especially for the disciples. And it was, again, the same thing. Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are those who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they separate you, revile you, and cast out your name as evil. Now in the first, hunger now, you shall be filled. But later on, he talked about woe. The difference is this one got woe, which Matthew does not have. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they separate you and revile you, and cast out your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so did your fathers to the prophets. Onwards is a basic, simple translation. Then he says, Woe! Wow, this one got woe. Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. That means your price is already here. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you that laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you. Do you know there's a woe to you when all men speak well of you? For so did their fathers to the false prophets. So if you got a few people don't speak well, then it remove a woe from you. And it says, but I say to you, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for them who are falsely accused. Now, verse uh, 28 has uh, been mistranslated, and uh, the Greek word there is actually falsely accused. It says, spitefully use you. Who's going to use you? But it's actually who falsely accuse you. And to him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other. And from him who takes away your clothes, do not even withhold your coat. So in other words, the things of this life, you know, don't affect you emotionally. You separate your emotions from the things of this life. And you become unaffected by all these uh, things that are there. And of course, uh, the word tunic and cloak, all that mistranslated sometimes, they translate it as cloak, but actually it's a general word for clothes or garments. Give to every man who asks of you, and from him who takes away your things, do not ask them back. Just let go. Forgive, forget. 
because uh, these are just natural things. And as you would that men should do to you, do likewise also to them. For if you love those who love you, and here's the thing, in the old translation they put, uh, what thank you, as if you're looking for thanks from some people, which is a mistranslation. And um, it tells you, uh, no, uh, it's not thanks, it's the word grace. In other words, uh, you do not show grace. If you love those who love you, where is grace? Actually, the meaning is, where is the grace there? Where is the supernatural grace? Where is the supernatural grace that shows that you are different from the world? Where is the supernatural grace that shows you are a son of God and not a son of man? Or not, not just a son of the world? He says, these are the things that make you different from everybody else. You are always full of grace. And we know what the English word grace is talking about. People who understand love, kindness, compassion. Graceful. A graceful person is not rude. Uh, no. So it's not thanks. Although the word has a meaning of thanks, but I believe Jesus meant something like, you know, where is the grace in that? Uh, there's no grace there. What grace is there? Uh, for sinners also love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what grace is there? There's no grace. For even sinners also do the same. If you lend to those you hope to receive, what grace is there? For sinners also, lend to sinners to receive as much back. I don't believe that Jesus is just asking, what thanks is there? Do people do things to get thanks? I don't think so. But Jesus was implying that there's a level you can live where you're full of grace and truth. Like Jesus. You know how sometimes people don't forgive easily? And then you say, well, this person, you know, uh, don't forgive easily. But when a person forgives easily, what, what, what impression do you have? You, you always think, this is a graceful man or woman. Correct? So Jesus was talking about becoming more godlike, becoming full of grace like him. He was full of grace. We have to do that in order to be full of grace. And again, he's comparing us. Love your enemies, do good land, hoping for nothing bad, and your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High. Truly show yourself to be the sons of the God who created the universe. For He is kind to the ungrateful. And uh, there is unthankful. But the word is, the word here is ungraceful. It's the negative word for grace. Like grace is charis, this is acharis, okay, acharistos. So it's more the, those who are ungrateful. And to the evil. For those who are not grateful for what he did, he still keep being kind to them. Benevolence. We call that unconditional love. Be you therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, you will not be judged. Condemn not, you will not be condemned. Forgive, you will be forgiven. Give and you will be given. The good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over shall man give into your bosom. For with the same measure they use, it will be measured back to you. Some of the other verses. And then he spoke a few parables. Let's look at the ending. He spoke a par parable to them, two parables. And one about judging people, and uh, which we all know about that verse. And, uh, he says, uh, do not uh, look at the speck in your brother's eye when you are playing your own eye. And then he ends with, a good tree brings not forth corrupt. It's not the word bad. The word bad is kakos. This is a word worse than bad. This is a word corrupt fruit. Neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not get a fix from thorns, nor get a grape from a bramble bush. These are words spoken to Jesus' disciples. Being a disciple of Jesus means you are living a higher standard. A higher standard of love, a higher standard of forgiveness, different from the world. And do not be attached to worldly things, he obviously is saying. When you, com when you combine all together, he is saying, this world is not your real home. That's why you are not affected by the people around you. 
And because this world is not your real home, when you do not have a good reception with people, not because of what you do, but because you're associated with Christ or you believe in God, don't let that bother you. Because these are not permanent things. Also, if you be a good steward by all means, be responsible for all the things God gave to you on this earth. But if you lose them, or someone takes them, don't fret away. The high standard is you're completely not affected by the things of this life. But in the end, the summary is in the three words he asks. What grace is there? We know Jesus says, the Bible says the Gospel of John, He is full of grace and truth. What is truth? Truth is the true reality, the true perception, true doctrine, true principles. What is truth? And when you apply from Jesus, let me point to the one in the Gospel of John, okay, fastest way than turning. He is our Lord Jesus. Our Lord Jesus is full of grace. In the end, it's about grace, which is in John chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten Father. Now, we are supposed to be the glorious church, correct? The entire church is full of glory. Our glory must be like Jesus' glory when He became flesh, and like Jesus' glory when He rose from the dead, which is much greater. What is the glory made up in the New Testament? It's made up of grace and truth. So if you want to be full of glory, you must be a graceful man or woman. There's another thing here. Why is truth mentioned after grace? Because grace comes first, then truth. Check the whole Bible. Grace comes first, then truth. Without grace, you cannot understand truth. Of course, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. But to know the truth, Jesus says, Blessed are those who are not offended. Instead of taking offense when your principles contradict Jesus' principles, your doctrine contradict Jesus' doctrine. Like the Pharisees, they are what I call champions of off being offended. Every little thing, they got offended. Sabbath got offended. Rough the, co the grain got offended. He on the Sabbath got offended. Everything they got offended. They could become more graceful, graceful people. Because they're always offended, they never come to the truth. And the offense was actually caused by their truth, which is false truth, contradicting the true truth because Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. He was the exemplary demonstration of what truth is. The true picture of Sabbath, the true picture of what you should do. So because truth involves a lot of depth and understanding and comprehension and it takes time, grace comes first. Choose always to be full of grace, be graceful, and then you'll be full of truth. Then the glory of God increases in your life. When we go to heaven, if we are taken to heaven right now, we all will shine to different degree. How much light flows through us is directly proportional to how much Jesus is in us. And how much Jesus is in us is directly proportional to how much grace and truth is in our life. That's why to see the truth is important. Here, when a person gets a truth, you know sometimes they get an idea, they put a light bulb, ping, a light bulb shines in their head. I don't know who got the idea, but it's quite a brilliant illustration. When in the spiritual world you absorb a truth, your light becomes changed on your inside. It actually changes you. We cannot see so much physically, but you see it 
over time. As a person comes to the truth more and more, their countenance change. And as you operate in the truth, your countenance change. And your health change. So over time, you can see it. But immediately in the spiritual world, you can see it. And if you're full of grace, which is full of love and gracefulness, why not we use love? Because grace is bigger than love. Love is only one aspect of God. Grace includes the other parts of love, light, and life. In Him was life. And when the Word became this life, He was full of grace. And that is why we must be full of grace in order to be full of glory. Full of truth in order to be full of glory. The more you walk with Jesus, the more graceful you are. Yes, final question. Uh, Pastor, how do we relate uh, mercy and grace? Ah, grace contains all of the seven spirits. Mercy is one aspect of the seven spirits. So the word grace is bigger. Grace is like the ocean. Mercy is like one of the seas in the ocean. Then when you compare this glory with the one in Deuteronomy, to answer the question, Deuteronomy, when, when Moses see God face to face in chapter... Uh, oh, sorry, Exodus. Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34. When he says, Show me your glory. And so God wanted to show you. He said that in chapter 33. But in chapter 34, when God came down and it says, so when he came down, oh, okay, that passed this occasion. Sorry, I went too fast. Okay. The Lord passed by him. The Lord descended in a cloud. Remember what Moses said, show me your glory. So when God actually came down, He says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness, truth, keeping mercy for thousands. You see, grace and truth is there, correct? But you see long-suffering, goodness, and truth. Everything the Bible summarizes to be two things. Grace, which has the seven spirits of God, and true, which has all the revelations of God. Grace and true. In the Old Testament, it seems to have many ingredients. Because in the Old Testament, grace has not been revealed in fullness. In the Old Testament, the word grace actually means favor with God. And so they, they can understand some level of mercy because they are the law. So there's a mercy seat. Remember, the maximum that they knew was mercy. They do not know love as much. They have some long suffering. They only got some level of goodness, some level of truth. But this is the content of glory. When Jesus came, who can compete with Jesus, right? When Jesus came, this is what is summarized. Grace and truth. And Jesus gave only one name for God, Father. Simple, succinct, and in the name of the Father, contain Al Elyon, Most High God, contain Al Shaddai, contain I am that I am, Yahweh. So inside the name of God, all Jesus summarized, Father. Which name is powerful? Right? We used to use the name of God is powerful to know His name. The angels know Him as God Most High. Of course, very powerful. Abraham know Him as El Shaddai. Moses know Him as Yahweh, which means I am. Jesus knows Him as Father. Tell me which is most powerful. Father. Ah, Jesus makes everything different. 
So, when Jesus, full of grace, and grace means so many things, it needs to be a word by itself. Grace includes thanksgiving. Grace includes a covenant with God, Eucharistio. The good joined to grace becomes a covenant, Eucharistio. Inside the Old Testament, remember there's goodness also, there's grace, but it hasn't combined together. When good, which is you, combines with grace, Eucharis becomes the Eucharist, which points to the covenant relationship, which points to thanksgiving. The Lord's Supper is called Eucharist. You from the word Eucharistio. So in the New Testament, a lot of things are joined together and they became more simplified. Because in Jesus, all we need to know is He represents fullness of truth. He represents fullness of grace. And when you, you know there's a spirit of grace, and you may ask, where does the spirit of grace stand with the spirit of peace, love, glory, power, life, wisdom, mercy? The spirit of grace represents all access to God. The spirit of grace was on Jesus. Didn't Jesus have the seven spirits? But yet the main spirit you see demonstrated is grace. Forgiveness, love, all flow through. And that's the secret. The secret is going back to the basics and seeing the power of grace. Now grace is not just being graceful. Grace is the substance of Jesus. Every bit of his molecule contain that for us. That's how we can be transformed and changed. We not only have the glory that Moses has a glimpse of, we actually have the substance of God, which is the glory of Jesus, who is the hypostasis, the substance of God, which is beyond anything. And no vocabulary can describe that. Praise the Lord. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, your name is so simple. But a name which the Old Testament folks never came to. They know the Yahweh, Rapha, the God, the healer. Yahweh Sikenu, the God of righteousness. Yahweh Shammah, the God who is there. And all the other names of Jehovah. But we know you as Abba, Papa. A name that shows we are yours, we are your sons, and that we know your heart and your mind. We thank you for Jesus. Without Jesus, we cannot be where we are. The best that we can be is to be as our Master and Lord Jesus. That we could absorb the substance of Jesus into us. We pray that as Jesus was full of grace and truth on the earth, may we as your glorious church be full of grace and truth. May we be the very example of what grace is and what truth is. May we be exactly like Jesus. As he was on the earth plus more because of his resurrection power. Thank you, Father, for this privilege to be like Jesus. What more can we ask? He is all we need. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap. Our friend God bless you.